1956, country music legend Johnny Cash wrote a song called I Walk the Line. It became his first number one Billboard hit and remained on the charts for more than 43 weeks. And not only did I Walk the Line become a song to define the man in black's career, but it also spoke to the trajectory of his life. See, originally, Cash wrote the song to express his desire to remain true and faithful to his wife in the face of many temptations. As his fame grew, so did the number of tours and the time away from his young family. It's a love song, really. A song of promise and devotion to someone outside of himself. And so let me just share, because I can't show you the song, but let me share the lyrics to the first verse. Here's what he wrote. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine, I walk the line. Hey, those are beautiful words to express devotion, right? Because you're mine, I walk the line. And anyone who's familiar with Johnny Cash's life and career will know that those words didn't hold true. In fact, his first marriage didn't last. But towards the end of his life, he revealed that there was a second meaning behind the words of I walk the line. You see, Johnny was originally a gospel singer. And unbeknownst to the record label, um, he calls this song, I Walk the Line, his very first gospel hit. And there was not only a romantic angle to these words, but also there was a spiritual one. And that actually ties in really well with the message today. We're continuing in our series in the New Testament letter of Ephesians. And believe it or not, we're coming towards the end. Today, we're going to round the corner into chapters, chapter 5 of 6. And as we've looked at the past few weeks, you know, the, this back half of Ephesians, chapters 3 through 6, is very practical. It's the writer Paul, he's taking this big, amazing story that God is writing, and he's helping connect it to our story, okay, how we live out our walking in Jesus. And it really all stems from Paul's call in Ephesians 4 verse 1, which has been part of my prayer for you, Oasis, these past few weeks. This is Ephesians 4 verse 1. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Oasis, you have been called by God. That's a big deal, okay? I've been watching a documentary called All or Nothing that follows major sports teams through a season. And what I love about it is you get to see behind the scenes of the life of a professional athlete. He so much goes into training for just those few minutes of actual game time we see on TV. It's, it's a high calling to be a professional athlete and it comes with a certain lifestyle and expectations. And that's similar to what Paul is calling the followers of Jesus to in Ephesians. And he's calling us to live out today. So you have been called by God. That that should lead to living in a way that reflects that calling. If I could sum up the message today in a big idea, it would be this. Life in Jesus transforms our daily walk. Life in Jesus transforms our daily walk. The more I think about the song, I Walk the Line, I feel like maybe Johnny Cash got it backwards, okay? And if you're a big fan of his music, okay, don't hate on me. It's not because you're mine, but I think rather it's because I'm yours, I Walk the Line. It's a subtle wording difference, but it's massive in how we live. Okay, our walk of faith is in Jesus, We don't effort our way to life in him. Rather, we're we're chosen, right? We're his. We've been called by God. He holds our destiny. And because we belong to him, we walk the line. So so what should our walking look like? That's a great question. We're going to jump into our passage in Ephesians 5 today. We're going to see Paul give us three walking commands. Walk in love. Walk as light walk in wisdom. We'll start reading in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. 
Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear child. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. These opening words, they point back to this call to walk worthy of our calling in God, right? Imitate God in everything you do. Why? Because you're, you're his dear child, right? These are inspired words, but also terrifying words, right? If you're a parent, then you understand all too well this call to imitate. And, and there's this old saying that any parent or mentor or influencer know to be true, right? So it's, it's a saying, do what I say and not what I do. Because the reality is, right, kids will imitate what they see, not what you say, unless it's an inappropriate word. And then for some reason, kids just seem to latch onto that. I mean, where's the grace in those situations, right? But we're called to imitate God, which, right, it doesn't seem fair because he's like God. Like, how are we supposed to do that well? When verse 2, it helps to kind of clarify this command. It says, follow the example of Christ. You see, Jesus came to show us, to show you and me what God is like, to display his love in a tangible way and his living and his sacrifice on the cross. And that love, it both fuels us and it fills us. It fuels how we walk. Because we are loved by God, we walk the line. And we live a life, we live a life of love for God and others. To help us better understand what this love for others can look like, Paul next describes what it shouldn't look like. Okay, we're going to pick up in Ephesians 5, verse 3. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Hey, don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. Hey, don't participate in the, in the things these people do. So to sum up, Kind of these verses, like we're, we're called to be full of God's love and not sexual lust. So, so how do these two things differ, right? How do they connect with this command to walk in love? Well, let me say it this way. God's love is self-giving. Lust is self-gratifying. When we think of God's calling on our lives, the kind of love on display is one that is sacrificial in nature. As Jesus said to his disciples on the very topic of serving, he says this in the gospel account of Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. God's love seeks to be to build others. Lust seeks to use others. And as we think about the one another aspect of these verses, right, in connection to us, Oasis, as the body of Christ, that kind of living should be nowhere found. As a high schooler, I memorized Ephesians 5.3, but out of the NIV translation, let me read this for you, Ephesians 5.3, part A in the NIV. But among you, there must not even be a hint of of sexual immorality. And I can remember thinking, man, that is such a high bar, right? Not even a hint, a suspicion, any ingredient for any kind of sexual immorality, impurity, or greed. And then to add to that, right, obscene stories and coarse joking, those are not for you either. And you may be thinking, as, as I can fall into thinking, like, that's great, Paul, but you don't understand what it's like in today's culture. Sex is everywhere. But even for Paul's Ephesian audience, this was a high and holy standard to demand. For immorality was commonplace in Asia Minor. And the Greek goddess Artemis, which in Ephesus, Diana of the Ephesians, that was the name, was regarded as a fertility goddess. So sexual immoral practices were regularly a part of worship in that cult. 
in that temple. And in verse 5, we kind of get to this nitty-gritty of why Paul is dealing with this issue of lust. He says it's incompatible with the kingdom of God. Like it doesn't, it doesn't connect. How so? Well, he says it's greed, right? That intense desire, intense self-desire for something. Paul says that greed is in reality, it's idolatry. It's, it's worshiping something short of God. And, and idol worship isn't something we usually, you know, we don't really think of that as an issue today, right? We don't see a lot of statues around, right? It's not as culturally prevalent, but it's still very much a struggle. And I love how Pastor Tim Keller, he describes idolatry. This is from his book, Counterfeit Gods. Anything more important to you than God? right? Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what only God can give. Okay, that, that's idolatry. Anything more important to you than God, whatever you seek, you know, whatever you seek for to bring fulfillment that, that only God can provide, that's, that's an idol. And we may not like, you know, have wooden or stone statues, but there are real things that we can idolize in life. Things like money, our self-image, power, substances like drugs or alcohol. They even, even like good things can, can be idols. Things like our kids, a spouse or significant other, food, okay, comfort. And as Paul is talking about here, sex. If we allow any of these to absorb our hearts and in our imagination more than God, they can become an idol. And coming back to Paul's words here in Ephesians 5, when we, when we allow sexual immorality to, to have a, a foothold in our hearts, when we are desiring something short of God's best, like that, that's idolatry. When we tell obscene stories or, or make coarse jokes, we're, we're degrading something that God has made holy. Okay, rather than degrade God's gifts, what does Paul call us to here? Right? We are called to give thanks. Right? Give thanks. All of God's gifts, including sex, are, are subjects for thanksgiving. Rather than for joking. Okay? To, to joke about them is, is, to, is bound to degrade. It's, it's bound to l- lessen their, their, their beauty, that what God has designed them for. To, to thank God for them is a way to preserve their worth as a blessing of our loving creator. And Paul warns us not to have any part in this kind of living. Don't don't allow others to explain or excuse away this kind of love as appropriate for God's people. They were called to be filled with God's love as displayed in Christ. It's not not in a self-pleasing lust. Okay, right? This one leads, right? This, This love from God leads to building others up while the other lust settles for simply using others. Okay, let's continue in, each, in Ephesians 5 and look at the second command, which is to walk in light. We'll pick up in Ephesians 5 verse 8. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. As those in Christ, because we're his, right? We walk the line. Or as Paul says here, right? We are people of light. And I love, I love that picture, right? We don't walk in the light, but rather what? Our walk as followers of Jesus should be light, right? We should be light. The shift from from darkness to light, it describes a transformation that is possible when we surrender our lives to Jesus, Okay, notice what, what Paul says here, right? You were once full of darkness. Okay, what, is, what does that mean, right? Interestingly, in this, in this present verse, Paul, he doesn't say that the believers were walking in darkness, but that they were darkness itself. That is like the, they were the embodiment of, of darkness. As such, they were held in sway by the power of sin and approved of others 
who practice sinful deeds, right? That, that's who they were. That's who we were. But, but, but now, right, we are what? We are new. We are light. Now you have light from the Lord. So Paul says what? So live as people of light. And what makes this image from Paul so amazing is, is the science that we now know and what's been discovered when it comes to both light and darkness, right? Did you know that darkness doesn't actually exist? It's true. If you look up what darkness is, the definition is this. It's simply the absence of light. It just describes a situation. It's not its own thing. And the same is true in our lives, right? The darkness that Paul describes is a life walked without Christ, it's the absence of his life and his light in us. Yet when you and I, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, the light of his presence, it fills our hearts and the darkness is expelled. The darkness has no room to hide. It's like when we open our lives to God's light, it transforms us. And as Paul says in verse 9, like this light produces good fruit in our lives. It produces what is right and true. And in another familiar letter that Paul wrote, he wrote to the church in Galatia, and he talks about uh, the fruit that characterizes a life filled with God's spirit or his light. And, and contrast that to what it produces when we walk in darkness. And, and it's the, what it what produces when we walk in light, it's the fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Right? Against such things there is no law. Okay, our walk in light will produce this kind of fruit. And what's amazing about light, you probably know this to be true, is it has the power to expose darkness. We've all been walking in that dark room, right, trying to navigate all the furniture and potential tripping hazards on the floor. And the difference, right, it makes when the light is turned on, right, the difference in how we walk, the difference in our confidence when we know what we're walking into, right? When we walk as light, it has the power to expose darkness. And what does that look like in our daily lives? Well, our walk of faith has the power to speak to a broken world. As we talked about in our commission series, you carry the power and the presence of Jesus. And that means something, right? It means when you empower by the Holy Spirit, when you walk into a workplace, walk into a neighborhood, walk into a grocery store, that you carry Jesus with you. That's, that's powerful, right? That has the ability to light up the darkness for those in darkness to be exposed to the light of Christ. And Lord willing to be transformed. God longs to do that. And he's called us. He's called you and me to be light. To walk as light. For the fruit of the spirit to be on display in how we follow him. And that leads well into the third command from Paul. Walk in wisdom. Let's finish reading uh, this section of chapter 5. We'll pick up in Ephesians 5 verse 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. You don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. True words. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Because we are filled and fueled with God's love, because we walk as light, it's important that we live like those who are wise. And I can't help but think of the words of wisdom. Maybe, maybe you know this from Uncle Ben to a young Peter Parker, a.k.a. Spider-Man, okay? the superhero Spider-Man. Here's what he told Peter. It says, with great power comes great responsibility. And going back to Johnny Cash's song, right? It's because we belong to Jesus, or I guess we tweaked it, right? Because we're his, filled with his spirit, that we choose to walk in wisdom. We choose to walk the line. And this, this command from Paul actually carries, if you, if you notice, through the entire passage. If you look back at verse 6, it says, don't be fooled. In verse 10, it says, carefully determine, right? Both these two first walks. And then they're both summarized here in verse 15. Be careful. Don't live like fools. Okay, Paul calls us to walk in wisdom, but how do we live this out? And I think verse 18 is the key. 
It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? That, that's, that's the key, be filled with the Spirit of God. And to help us illust- to help illustrate this command, Paul kind of compares these two different influences that, that characterize both foolish and wise living. And it comes a bit out of left field until we see it in this light, right? This comparison of foolish and wise living, right? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Okay, being under the influence of one, it leads to foolish decisions, while the other leads to life. And we've all seen the effects of someone who's had too much alcohol, right? It's not, it's not a pretty sight. And, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was both a physician and a pastor, he had this to say about these two influences in Ephesians 5. He says, wine or alcohol, this is pharmacologically speaking, is not a stimulant. It's, it's a depressant. It depresses first and foremost the highest centers of all in the brain. They, they can, the, the things that control everything that gives a person self-control, wisdom, understanding, discrimination, judgment, balance, right? The power to assess everything. In other words, everything that makes a person behave at their, bare, their very best and highest. Okay, right? it, it will ruin your life is what Paul says here. But, but what does the Holy Spirit do? Right? How, how is that influence different? Well, he says it's the exact opposite. Here's how Dr. Lloyd-Jones describes the influence of the Holy Spirit. If it were possible to put the Holy Spirit into a textbook of pharmacology, I would put him under the stimulants. For that is where he belongs. He really does stimulate. He stimulates our every faculty, the mind and the intellect, the heart and the will. Don't be under the influence of anything less than the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit who brings life, power and purpose into our walk. And then this, this passage, it concludes with looking kind of at three ways that the Holy Spirit, this influence of the Spirit, it impacts our walk. And the first one Paul talks about is connection to others, right? Verse 19 says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. And when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, right, that impacts the way we, we talk to each other, how we influence each other in Christ. Okay, the, the second thing here, personal worship. The second half of verse 19 says, making music to the Lord in your hearts. When, when the Holy Spirit is stimulating our worship, it, it just it grows our passion and our awareness of God's presence. You know, when, when we have the Spirit in us, we don't need a worship song. We don't need a leader to bring us into God's presence. It just happens, right? As we become aware of his presence and his work in our lives. And that leads really well to the, the third influence that the Holy Spirit has on our walk. And the third thing is this, it's gratitude, right? Verse 20 says, give thanks for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, we walk in gratitude, be thankful for all things, right? For, for how God has transformed us by his grace and he's filled us with his spirit, right? His power and his presence in us. And and that kind of influenced walk in Christ will speak loudly to our family, our neighbors, our co-workers, and our community. And as I wrap up this message, I have just a few next steps for us. The first is become a follower of Jesus. I can't think of a better way to end this message than to be thankful for how Jesus has rescued us. How he can take a broken and darkened heart and he, and he can fill us with his light. Right? We are redeemed. We're made new. And every dark corner in our hearts is exposed to his grace and love. If that's something you long to experience, like this, this life in God's spirit, let someone in your home church know. Okay, We'd love to pray for you and help you take next steps in what it means to follow Jesus. Another next step is this walk in love. Kind of looking at that first command, are there idols in your life? Places where you've settled for something less than God's best. Hey, remember, they can be so much more than just images of wood or stone, but even good things that we've made ultimate. Maybe as we've talked about sexual morality, there are areas where you've allowed lust to take hold 
of your heart. Okay, maybe, or maybe there's other, other areas of life that have become more important than God. Okay, if you recognize there are areas, maybe, maybe there's been some nudges in your heart during this message. That's the Holy Spirit telling you, hey, don't ignore this. Surrender those areas to God. Ask him to fill you with his spirit. Which leads right into our last next step, which is this, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, don't be under the, uh, under the influence of anything short of God's best. If we long to be light, to walk in love, to walk in wisdom, and make the most of every opportunity, we need the Holy Spirit. He longs to fill us anew every day, to draw us deeper into God's love, to display His power and presence through us as we walk. It's a simple prayer. Holy Spirit, fill me up. Oasis, this passage calls us to big things. And my prayer is that we take hold of all that God is calling us to. And as we walk into this week, we've got our last prayer focus. And for this week, our prayer focus is ministry opportunity, which I think is a perfect way to conclude our month of prayer. And it ties in well to this message. Okay, let's pray for opportunity to be light in our community, in our neighborhoods as home churches. How and where might God be calling us to bring his light and expose darkness, to display his love and power? If you'd like to pray in person, I'll continue to open the building from noon to one for any that would like to come and join me. Otherwise, wherever, whenever is most consistent for you, that's great. Go with that. God bless Oasis.